Good morning, everybody, and thank you so much for joining us. Uh, I'm Assemblymember Mark Berman, and I want to welcome everyone to today's Computer Science Education Forum. It's a very exciting time for computer science, and there are a lot of new developments that we're going to learn about today. This is also a very timely discussion, because as some of you may know, the legislature designated September as California Computer Science Education Month to highlight the crucial role that computer science education can play in students' lives. We're here today to focus on closing the computer science gap in K-12 education so that as a state, we make sure all students are ready for their future. Growing up in Palo Alto, I saw firsthand the impact education can have in creating a level playing field where every student, regardless of socioeconomic background, has the opportunity to, the opportunity to get the education that they need. Before I was elected to the assembly, I worked at the Silicon Valley Education Foundation a nonprofit focused on STEM education and closing the achievement gap in public schools. In my work at the foundation, I was committed to making sure that all students in Silicon Valley attend schools that are equipped to teach them the skills they need to thrive in the 21st century economy. Computer science is one of those foundational skills. It's transforming industry, bolstering productivity, and driving job creation and innovation. Access to computer science education for all California students especially young women and underrepresented minorities, is vital to ensure that California remains competitive in the global economy. As the representative from Silicon Valley, the birthplace of the technology revolution, I see the need for computer science education all around me. I'm hosting this education forum to elevate the discussion and also to bring awareness that not all schools and not all students have the same access to computer science education. We have two fantastic panels featuring experts in their fields. The first, panel will share, the first panel will share perspectives on the need to close the existing skills gap. The second panel will share computer science breakthroughs in California. Let me take a moment to recognize the sponsors who made this event possible, and they will all have an opportunity to make brief comments at the end of the panels. I would like to begin by thanking former assembly member Susan Bonilla, who's here in the front row, uh, who is currently the California Director for Council uh, who is currently the California Director for Council for a Strong America and led the effort in organizing and planning today's forum. Susan, thanks so much. Uh, Susan is a champion of computer science, and as a member of the California Legislature, she authored critical legislation to develop recommendations for a computer science strategic implementation plan, which is one of the breakthroughs that we will discuss today. In addition, I would like to thank Alliance for California Computing Education for Students in Schools, otherwise known as ACCESS, the Bay Area Council, the Council for a Strong America, CS for CA, and we decided if you're posting on social media, use the hashtag CS for CA, East Bay Leadership Council, Microsoft, Mission Readiness, Ready Nation, the Silicon Valley Leadership Group, TechNet, and the City of East Palo Alto for hosting us today. I should also mention that Ready Nation and Mission Readiness are part of Council for a Strong America, and today they're releasing their report, Connecting Classrooms to STEM Careers, which will be discussed here. I also want to recognize the elected officials who are joining us today. Perfect timing. And we have, uh, once again, Susan Bonilla, a former assembly member, Lynn Bauman, board member of the La Honda Pescadero Unified School District, Brian Johnson, board member from the Los Altos School District. Yay. Alyssa McAvoy, trustee from the Redwood City School District. Yay. Michelle Magano, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly. Magano. Uh, board member of the Sunnyvale School District. Yay. Reed Myers, board member of the Sunnyvale School District. Uh, Hillary Paulson, trustee of the Redwood City School District. Alan Sarver, uh, board member of the Sequoia Union High School District and Ellen Wheeler, uh, board member of Mountain View Wisman. And uh, we'll make sure to recognize other folks as they come in. Uh, I'm sure they're looking for parking. <laughs> so uh, I'm also excited to be joined by San Mateo County Superintendent of Schools and Elect, Nancy McGee. Uh, and Nancy will be assuming her new role uh, at some point uh, before early in the new year. And before we hear from the first panel, I'd like to give Superintendent Elect McGee an opportunity to share a local update on computer science education. Thank you so much, Assemblymember Berman. I want to begin by thanking you for your um, 
impactful leadership in this area. This is a this is a really tough climb we have ahead. I'm going to be a realist here, as my colleague in San Francisco Unified mentioned. This is there are a lot of factors at stake to get to the deep level of implementation for computer science for all students, especially our women and our underrepresented students, so that all students have the opportunity. But without driving from the top as you're doing and uh, giving this in incredible, powerful movement a strong voice, we would not be able to make progress. So thank you so much. I'm very new in my gig. In fact, I'm a pre-county superintendent at this moment, but so I'm going to um, take the advantage of uh, not knowing everything there is to know about computer science. But what I do know is um, I graduated from San Jose State with a master's in information, library and information um, sciences, master's degree, and that was in the year 2000 when in our schools we were deciding should we let the students on the internet. Mm -hmm. And um, that was 18 years ago. And it is, we have to really wake up and understand that what used to be called 21st century literacy and preparation is all around us every day. We're ensconced in it. We are the future. We are in the future. So what we need to do now is we need to prepare our students, not necessarily for the 21st century because we're immersed in it, but we need to make our students future ready. We need to give them the skills every student the skills to be successful in that future world. So it's my pleasure to be here. Um, one wonderful thing about computer science is the breadth of um, analytical, critical, creative, and communicative thinking that it involves. I think I just listed the four C's that we're trying to get our students involved in. Um, I also was a teacher in the classroom, a high school English teacher for 20 years. And during that time, I was an, av an AVID teacher and an AVID coordinator, which is a program that supports underrepresented students in colleges and universities to access rigorous um, curriculum and get through AP courses, complete A through G, and get um, accepted into universities and then be successful there. So I have fought, fought these battles at the school level with my colleagues about who should have access into rigorous and engaging curriculum. I do believe that we have to begin computer science at the earliest grades. San Francisco Unified has a wonderful model that you'll hear about later. Um, we need to engage our, our girls and our um, students, uh, our underrepresented students in this exciting and open-ended opportunity, and if we don't start early, they will get left behind. So as we lead in this way, we have to have a focus on equity. It has to be a language in the policy, and it has to be um, involved in our practice. Um, my last three years, I have been running our schools and our court and community uh, programs in San Mateo County, so serving education for all those students who are incarcerated. We have um, brought in some um, very innovative programs for those students, opening pathways straight to College of San Mateo. Those students are now uh, articulating into UC Berkeley and participating in underground scholars. The other important thing we have to do is express and act on the belief that every student can learn and access success in all the ways possible. If we undercut ourselves in that belief, we will not make progress. So let me take a step back very quickly and just uh, summarize what we have going on in San Mateo County. We're a unique county because we have 23 smaller school districts. We are not a single county and school district like San Francisco Unified, which offers um, unique opportunities to do things differently. In San Mateo County, 23 different school boards, 23 different ways of doing things. But what we do have at the County Office of Education is Dr. Emily Tomford. We've hired her as our computer science coordinator. She has a doctorate in artificial intelligence from the University of Edinburgh. And she is an amazing advocate for this work. So right there, I feel like we have a leg up on making progress. 
through her work, we have several grants, one through the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative with the Ravenswood School District and the Redwood City School District, where we are providing professional development to teachers that is essentially the um, equivalent of an AP computer science course. Many of our teachers did not have the opportunity to study computer science themselves when they were going through school. And their level of comfort and confidence in passing on that information to their students might need some you know, fill, backfill. So we are providing that professional development. We also are working with um, some of our school districts through their migrant education funding. It's after school programming, but we are having those students build and publish apps to solve everyday problems in their community. We have some video of um, those classrooms. They're full of kids, all different kinds of diverse students, seventh graders, maybe 28, 29, 30 kids. And they are working to build or create a computer game. And you would not, you can see the thought clouds, the complex thought clouds over all of their heads as they're intensely involved in the work that's in front of them. So we know that this is a great, um, a great move for our students in their thinking, in their development, and for our um, workforce in the 20, I don't want to say the 21st century, in the years ahead. How's that? So um, with that, I think I'll pass it back to Mark Furman. Thank you so much, Nancy. I'm looking forward to working together for the next long time. Yeah. Um, so first, I want to introduce our first panel, and we just we asked both panels to go ahead and sit up here uh, while they're presenting. We're going to have presentations from the panels, and then we'll open it up to Q and A uh, for everybody afterwards. And I also want to make sure to note for uh, anybody who wants it, there's coffee and I think some water in the back um, of the room. So uh, first, uh, furthest on my right is Vice Admiral Jody Breckenridge, who currently serves as chair of the board of directors for San Francisco Water Emergency Transportation Authority. Prior to her community and board service, Vice Admiral Breckenridge served 34 years in the U.S. Coast Guard, and she retired in 2010 from her assignment as Commander of Pacific Area and Defense Forces West. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, next, I have Dr. Angelo Farouk, who is elected as the Vice President of the Governing Board for the Riverside Unified School District. Uh, and we were uh, talking before I, I went down and had a hearing at UC Riverside earlier. Uh, it's fantastic to see what's going on down there. Uh, in 2013, Dr. Farouk was appointed by Governor Brown to the California Workforce Investment Board, and he serves as the founding director of the UC Riverside Center for Economic, Center for Economic Development and Innovation. Thanks for coming up with it. And I, uh, to my right, I have Jessica Ware, who oversees Microsoft's philanthropic investments in Silicon Valley focusing on computer science education, workforce development, and civic technology. Uh, and I'm going to turn it over to the panelists. All right. Perfect. Well, good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, before I begin my remarks, I just want to offer my appreciation to Assemblymember Berman for your leadership and focus on this. Uh, th th this is not going to be a sprint. Uh, as you've already realized, uh, we all need to realize that this is not going to be solved overnight and it's going to take all of us collectively working together uh, to get to the end game here. Um, but with any massive project like this, it takes a, an individual of vision and leadership to make sure that we remain focused on the task at hand. And we want to thank you, sir, for uh, your leadership on this. Superintendent McGee, thank you for hosting us today. Thank you for what you've already done, but thank you for undertaking the challenges that you've articulated for us here t uh, today. Um, I know this school system is in very good hands. I was very inspired by what you said and very excited about what you had to offer. Um, you know, at the, at the end of the day, for all the discussion that we have here today, it's going to take us supporting our education systems, which are our administrators and our teachers, and our students, because that's what it's really all about, and that's why we're here today. I want to thank the city of uh, East Palo Alto for hosting us, uh, and also for Assemblymember Berman's staff, and also to the Council for a Strong America uh, for managing and planning all the logistical elements. And lastly, thank you to 
each of you for being here today, for your interest and for what you'll offer uh, in richness to this forum. So I'm very honored to be here along with my uh, fellow panelists, uh, Dr. Farouk and uh, uh, Ms. Jessica Ware. Uh, between the three of us, we hope to deliver unique perspectives on why the need exists to, to close the skill gaps that our students face upon completion of high school. I'm a member of Mission Readiness, which is a national security nonprofit of more than 700 uh, flag and general officers who work uh, to make smart investments in America's youth. And why do we do this? Because we're concerned about the national security gap that we have, where more than 70% of America's youth from 17 to 24 does not qualify for military service today because they are not academically prepared, are too overweight, or have a record of crime or drug abuse. While it is a matter of national security that DOD faces, it is not just DOD, it is our nation at large. It just so happens that DOD has the statistics to bring this issue to the forefront. But across our workforce and across our economy, many, many other sectors face the same challengers. So if you take that statistic and kind of flip it on end, that means 30% roughly qualified today. And if you can imagine in the competitive world uh, in which our economy runs today, the pressure on that 30% is immense. But there's so much talent in the 70%. We talked about realizing the potential of all of that youth. We need that youth to become qualified and to become contributing members of our economy. To maintain a competitive advantage over our adversaries, the United States Armed Forces requires a STEM-skilled military and civilian workforce capable of developing leading-edge technologies. California plays a large role in this front. For example, we are home to world-class national laboratories like, like Lawrence Livermore or China Lake that strengthen national security by applying science, technology, and engineering to mission areas including, including biosecurity, counterterrorism, intelligence science, nonproliferation, and basic science research. Consider for a moment the city of San Diego, where approximately 20% of their gross regional product is the, is the result of defense-related spending. It's also important that we remember that America's largest employer is the U.S. government, and national security spending in California alone conservatively equates to more than $156 billion in economic output and more than 750,000 jobs created. It rivals agriculture. Therefore, it is an economic and national security imperative that California invest in high-quality STEM programs, including adequate resources for students and teachers in order to develop a skilled workforce for the future. And I would note that DOD, recognizing this, has invested in their own programs. Across the nation, we participate in partnership and education programs with local schools, and DOD has its own uh, STEM program called Starbase for fourth through eighth grade. 66 programs across the nation that use STEM-based principles to teach uh, children in a hands-on environment problem-solving skills. We have three of those programs here in California, at Edwards Air Force Base, Los Alamitos, and in Sacramento. We also have a unique innovation center not very far from here in, in uh, Mountain View, which is intended to connect to the uh, commercial technology uh, system and to participate in key innovation. You know, basic research and innovation is what not only makes our economy strong, it's a driver for the United States and for the United States military. I want to thank you for the opportunity to participate in this forum. I look forward to the questions, and I would like to leave you with just a very basic thought. If you think about our economy and what the economy represents, not only to our nation, but to the state of California, it's all about the quality of your workforce. If you don't have the right quality in your workforce, you're at a distinct disadvantage, and we simply can't afford this in the state or in the nation. Thank you. So, good morning, everyone. 
Uh, my name is Angelo Farouk, and I want to thank Assemblymember Berman and Superintendent McGee for uh, inviting me here, and also just for your leadership. I think the fact that you represent Silicon Valley and you have the vision on how the rest of the Cal state of California can adopt that kind of culture of innovation is extraordinary, and I really want to commend you. And I want to thank Vice uh, Admiral Breckenridge for sharing your perspectives on the impact that the technology skills gap has on our armed forces. And as an entrepreneur, I really value the perspective from industry, and I'm looking forward to hearing Jessica Ware's comments. This is a topic that I'm very passionate about. I serve as the Vice President of the Riverside Unified School District, and we are one of the largest school districts in the state of California. We govern 50 schools with an operating annual budget of half a billion dollars. And I was proud that I led the effort for our school district to be the first in the entire country to partner with Girls Who Code to start systematically addressing the gender equity gap with computer science. Our district has now actually taken on the effort to embed computer science curriculum through the entire K-12 school district. So it's not an extracurricular activity, but it's actually fundamentally part of this the school district and that way from an equity standpoint again all students are being exposed to it and we understand that even besides the occupational and career opportunities that computer science has inherent skill sets that will be are transferable to a lot of other applicable industries we uh, are also proud to actually lead the second largest consortium for code.org in the entire country we have 19 school districts from riverside san Bernardino, and los angeles counties that come to Riverside, our school district, for their teachers to be trained on coding. Uh, one more additional thing I just want to mention is that we have established a program called Family Code Night, and we were featured uh, when President Obama was in office by the White House on this, where we have our parents learning coding with their children. And we bring tacos, and it's uh, an opportunity not just to increase student engagement for the students to be more active in the space, but because our district has a very high percentage, 66% of parents that qualify for uh, free or reduced lunch for the, the children, we use this as an opportunity for the parents to realize that this is something that maybe they can get exposed to and we connect them from a county workforce standpoint on career opportunities for themselves. Uh, so there's a lot of different perspectives there. And we know that research indicates that there's a lack of representation of girls and people of color overall in the STEM fields. Uh, I believe women constitute only about 20% in the industry. And, but the point I want to make is that even if you don't prioritize equity as an inherent value like myself, and I'm sure the, the panel, we understand that from a practical standpoint, according to economists, that in just three short years, the U.S. is poised to add one million new jobs in STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math fields. Yet in California, schools are struggling to keep pace with that demand. By 2030, it is estimated that California will have 1.1 million vacancies uh, of jobs that are requiring at least a bachelor's degree. But we don't need to look that far into the future. The new report, Connecting Classrooms to STEM Careers, right here, highlight the fact that California today has over 75,000 open computing jobs. These are desirable, high-paying jobs with average salaries of over $100,000. That kind of pay provides a level of economic mobility that can break the cycle of poverty that permeates many families generation after generation. Not only will these STEM occupations provide personal economic stability, but they will drive the U.S. and California economy, and we have growth projections of 20 to 40 percent nationwide. Many metropolitan areas here in California are booming with STEM jobs. Not surprisingly, right here in the San Jose, Silicon Valley, broader region, ranks first in the nation for having the largest share of STEM occupations, along with many other coastal communities. But I want to emphasize, as somebody who comes from inland California, that there's a big opportunity to expand these STEM career jobs and development opportunities in the inland California. Time Magazine recently, in the past year, named Riverside as the number one destination in the country for millennials to move, actually. And the combination of the relative affordability and having a world-class University of California, among other local colleges, provides a unique opportunity for an innovative innovation ecosystem 
to thrive that's based on diversity and on access. And we recently, uh, which I, I was a founding board member of, established a technology incubator accelerator as a partnership between UC, the city, and the county. And our, again, our, we are putting a priority on getting women and people of color, particularly to start businesses as entrepreneurs. I'm also proud that our school district is taking a leadership role in this space. And we are in the process of establishing a public STEM high school on the physical campus of University of California, Riverside. And so this is an extraordinary vision, very unique. Uh, UC San Diego has a charter school that, that is physically on their campus for high school. But this will be, my understanding, the first public school uh, statewide at a major research university. And this isn't just a concept. We've, UCR has identified specific land options for us. We passed a local bond measure over $400 million to finance this. And we know that this kind of a project will provide extraordinary possibilities, especially given the demographics of our community that I mentioned earlier. But also to get students to have that mindset where they're physically coming to uh, a university campus, again, of the UC caliber brand, to get into that cultural mindset, to get access to laboratories, uh, faculty. And we want to make this a district-wide asset, so beyond even the students that proactively choose to go to that STEM school, that we will have all the students as early as we can, again, starting as elementary school, get exposed to those opportunities and so that they can also participate in a part-time capacity at that school. And one of our key proposed areas of study will be computer science, as our, our research projects projects that more than half of all future STEM jobs are going to be from that field. And it's this type of uh, visionary planning that we are hoping to plan, again, for the future. Uh, and that's the nature of this initiative. California is home to $385 billion tech industry. And it is imperative that we prepare students for the technical aptitude that they will need to succeed in the workplace. Students who think critically and use technology to solve problems will be better prepared for both post-secondary education and their future career success. We can help them get there by investing in policies and programs that prioritize rigorous academic content, the ability to collaborate, and effective verbal and written communication skills. These deeper learning skills can be taught and reinforced through hands-on learning and other innovative education approaches such as linked learning that offer students a pathway from classroom to career. And we know that art is actually a very critical component. I know many of you have heard the vernacular of STEAM, and that's another area where we're driving a lot of enthusiasm and engagement among students. Access to these promising educational approaches is critical concern, as we know that many students today are lacking an opportunity and missing out on learning the fundamentals of computer science. We're not talking about the typing classes that many of us remember taking in high school. Computer science coursework today includes coding, but it also provides instruction that is applicable across many fields, such as engineering, science, and medicine. Many of these courses align with college admission requirements, making them even more critical. As technology rapidly advances, we have an increasing impact on professions and business sectors. It is critical that all children have an opportunity to experience and engage in educational environments committed. I know that the term 21st century skill development Maybe a little bit out of vogue, but, but definitely in terms of the future needs and current needs. Building students' critical thinking and problem-solving skills will help them prepare to become part of a highly adaptable workforce that California needs to keep pace and lead in the global marketplace. This concludes my remarks. Thank you for your time today, and I appreciate my opportunity to provide insights with the system which panel. Thank you. Thank you very much to my fellow panelists, and thank you also to Assemblymember Berman. I am just one of Assemblymember Berman's many very engaged and very opinionated constituents. Uh, so congratulations on serving that incredible population. Good luck with that. Uh, it's so nice to be here today. It's I'm glad you're all here today. It's nice to see so many friends in the room. Uh, I've spent the last six years managing Microsoft's philanthropy in Silicon Valley, and but before that, I was a teacher. Before that, I was a STEM dropout. Uh, true confession time. So I started college as a physics major, and but my degree is in literature. So I, it worked out okay, I'm fine, but I'm carrying all of that experience with me in my work today, supporting computer science education. 
So I want to start by acknowledging and furthering your remarks about the need for computer science education from an industry perspective. So there are very straightforward facts here about the workforce and its gaps, and we know them. Microsoft and other tech companies need more engineers, more software and hardware engineers. At this moment, there are thousands of open, very well-paying engineering jobs in this valley alone, monitoring systems. Our salespeople have to know what they're talking about to, to sell their products and services effectively. A full half of the jobs in the tech sector, with all those cushy benefits and those great salaries, are non-technical jobs like mine, but require digital literacy to do them well. So it's not just about growing a generation of engineers. More and more, being part of the workforce at all requires digital skills. Um, and I'll put it here, this isn't just a private sector issue. We'd all be much better off with more technical expertise inside government, inside our schools, inside our legal system, inside our nonprofits. And I would go even further and argue that I need computer science education as a human being living in America. Uh, the systems that shape and govern my life that determine how my vote gets counted, how I contact my elected officials, how my paycheck gets deposited, how I view photos of my niece, how all my healthcare records are transferred, those are all digital systems. And if I don't understand how they work, fundamentally I can't protect myself, I can't protect my privacy, and I can't engage in civic life in a meaningful way. So I hope I've convinced you that computer science education is together. We've got, we've got you there, right? I mean, I feel like we're preaching to the choir a little bit today, but yes. Okay, so we all think computer science education is important and great. I want to take just a few minutes here to explain how Microsoft's approach to supporting computer science education has evolved with examples from some of our great nonprofit partners in Silicon Valley. So at Microsoft, one of our main philanthropic goals is to increase equitable participation in high quality computer science education. We picked all those words very carefully, so I'll say them again. We want to increase equitable participation in high quality computer science education. Okay, so increasing participation is not that hard. You can give ch kids a chance to try programming, whether it's through Hour of Code, or spending a week at a coding camp, or joining an after school program. Those resources all exist up and down the peninsula. We've supported them at Boys and Girls Clubs, some of the local museums, organizations like Maker Ed, and YWA Silicon, Silicon Valley. Participation is one thing, but equitable participation is harder. And I, I want to echo your thoughts here. We, we do carefully select our nonprofit partners to make sure they're serving at least 50% young women and ideally 80% underserved populations, whatever that means locally. But if you're really after equity and reaching all the kids, you can find all the kids in school. You need to go to public schools. So for the last 18 months or so, we've really focused on public schools and public school teachers. Through our TEALS program, well, as, as we've talked about a little bit, the reality is there simply aren't enough teachers prepared to teach computer science education. So we've found some ways to help. Through our TEALS program, we pair volunteer engineers from the tech sector with teachers who have, so that you have subject matter expertise and teaching expertise in the same room. It turns out teachers are smart and good at learning. <laughs> so 85% of those teachers are on track to be able to teach computer science on their own after two years. You expose them to the subject matter, you give them some confidence, you give them a chance, and two years later they're ready to go on their own. Currently we have TEALS programs in 53 schools across the state and will support 18,000 students across the country this year. And we know TEALS works because TEALS students have AP scores that are 9% higher than the national average, which is great. Um, but in talking about the issues of teacher capacity and professional development, locally we've supported nonprofits like Silicon Valley Education Foundation, Code.org, the Tech Museum, and San Jose State University, as they help San Jose, Silicon Valley teachers train over the summer to become both com stronger computer science instructors, if they're already doing that, or even building coding exercises into their classrooms, even if they're history and literature teachers. That you can build those principles inside the classroom and teach content in a holy way while you're teaching digital skills. Okay, so we're working on increasing participation. We're trying to make that participation equitable. But when it comes to having genuinely high quality computer science education available for everyone, well now we're talking about policy. Uh, so Robin Hines and Jonathan Noble are in the audience. They lead our California policy work. And in the past few years, we've been thrilled to support legislation to establish the state's computer science advisory board and work towards computer science education standards statewide. We're also partnering with Children Now to set up a STEM hub in Silicon Valley to help nonprofits and funders and educators share best practices and genuinely collaborate. If you're interested in that, talk to Vince Hyman's. We'll be uh, <laughs> launching that project in, in late November, so look out for that. So at Microsoft, we want to generate excitement about computer science, but we also want to build the capacity and support the policy that gives that excited student the high-quality education she deserves. And so here's the vision. Imagine a kid living here in EPA, maybe she's at St. George at Elementary, down the street. What would it take for her to see computer science education as exciting for her, as relevant to her, as accessible for her, and welcoming for her? She'll need those thrilling moments of discovery. Maybe she'll get it. Boys and Girls Clubs of the Peninsula, they do a great job. 
She'll need teachers who are up to date and ready to accelerate her learning with the, the latest and greatest in education. But she'll also need a web of policy and legislation that strengthen, protect, and enrich her education. She needs all of those things. So let's give them to her. And in return, we will get an engaged member of the community. We'll get a productive member of the workforce. And we will get a more equitable future for all of us. Thanks. Well, thank you uh, all so much for those uh, poignant comments. Uh, and I want to turn it over to panel two, uh, which is going to talk about breakthroughs in California on computer science education. And uh, we have from uh, my right to left, uh, Brian Twarik, who's the Computer Science Program Administrator for the San Francisco Unified School District. Uh, Mr. Twarik is also a member of the Board of Directors of the Computer Science Teachers Association, and he co-chair of the California Computer Science Standards Advisory Committee. We also have Julie Flappin, who is the Executive Director of the Alliance for California Computing Education for Students in Schools and the director of the Computer Science Project at UCLA Center X. And we have Emmanuel Onidor, who is a computer science teacher at Oakland Technical High School and began teaching computer science in 1996. I wish I started taking it in 1996. <laughs> uh, developing strategies to address the issues of equity and access to computer science education, particularly for underrepresented groups. Thanks so much for joining us today. Uh, Mr. Tor, if you want to lead us off. Thank you. Uh, pleased to be here. Um, so in my day job, I work for the San Francisco Unified School District and manage our computer science education programs. And we're working to implement uh, creative, relevant, and rigorous computer science education from pre-K through 12. And what we've noticed as we've begun implementing at all levels is as teachers start, they're teaching a lot of the same concepts. Uh, so students often learn about loops at every level. And we see the need of defining what students learn as they progress through a coherent and cohesive curriculum. So today I'm going to focus the conversation on uh, the new California K-12 computer science standards, which were adopted by the State Board of Education just a few weeks ago. Um, there is a, yay, that's a great news. Yeah. Uh, if, if you have a folder, there is a, a little handout, and that could be a helpful reference. So we all know that California has been a leader in computer science for a long time, especially given where we are at the moment. Uh, but it's only recent that California is becoming a leader in CS education as well. And I think these standards are a big part of that. Um, after having reviewed standards from the other states that exist, uh, I feel pretty confident saying that these are the best standards that exist. Uh, and I think they'll go a long way in helping drive that high quality um, vision that Jessica spoke of. So it's important to note that these are model standards, which means that they are recommended by the Department of Education, but they're not required. Um, so part of our, this needs to be supported through policy at both the state and the local levels in order to support the equitable implementation. So the standards are built on what's called the K-12 Computer Science Framework. And that was a national document uh, that stakeholders and, and edu educators created. And it defines computer science as five concepts and seven practices. And the five concepts divide computer science into the things that students should know. And that includes programming and algorithms, but it also includes other important elements like data, networks, computing systems, and impacts of computing. So we heard before, Jessica spoke of like the need for students in today, or people in today's world to have a, deep, a deepened understanding of computer science um, so that we can understand like things like, uh, like if we move towards um, digital polling in, in elections. And so we need to know about the implications of storing data digitally and how that works. In addition to the what, which is like the concepts, we also have seven practices. And this is what students should be able to do in computer science. And four of those practices comprise computational thinking, which is how we take a problem and consider how a computer, a computer or computing system could be used to address that problem. There's also three other practices that support computational thinking. And those are fostering an inclusive computing culture, collaborating, and communicating. 
So standards take those puzzle pieces, concepts and practices, and they combine them to create learning outcomes. And that defines what students should arrive at after taking courses or engaging in curriculum. Now the curriculum is set locally, and that is what determines how students arrive at those outcomes. And the standards were designed purposefully to be very flexible in how that's implemented. So in San Francisco, we at the elementary level focus about on integration with literacy, whereas other districts may focus on integration with math or teaching it discreetly. And so the standards allow for that flexibility and have some guidance for how um, that integration can occur. The standards were designed for all students and to be arrived or be achieved by students from K through 12. They're broken down into four grade bands, K2, 3, 5, 6, 8, and 9, 12. And the 9, 12 or high school grade band also has a second level called specialty. And those are designed as a continuation of the pathway for those students who elect to take specialty or deep in courses such as career technical education, AP dual credit. Throughout the standards, there are links to other California content standards, such as Common Core for English and Math, as well as History, Science, Social Studies, um, PE, etc. So at the bottom of page two, you can see one standard we pulled the, from the grade three, five band about algorithms. And it presents, the, the crux of the idea is that students will look at algorithms, which is a step of, of a ordered list of steps to complete a task, and comparing them to see which is most appropriate for a given context. And there's examples that show how this could be applied in a mathematics context, an ELA context, or history, social studies. And the idea here is that any of these works, and students can arrive at similar outcomes, but it's up to the schools and the local context for what works best for them. The statements were developed by a committee of educators that were appointed by the State Board of Education. And that went through a long process. And that process went through, uh, started with the Computer Science Teacher Association standards, and then it revised them for the California context. And it worked to improve them to add linkages to all of our other content standards, and uh, to, um, to beef up, especially at the upper levels, for what we, decide, what we believe is possible for all of our students. There was a particular lens of equity throughout so our goal is to make sure that all of these standards are achievable and accessible to all of our students. And then we set a really high bar for what, what we believe students can achieve. Along with the standards, we have a num number of other things that are articulated in the standards documents. And that's because there will be no framework for computer science in the near future, like there are for many other content areas. So it, along with the standards and the introduction, there's some great material on why computer science is important. So many things that you heard our first panelists mention, those are articulated pretty concisely in a document that are great to share with other policymakers. It also aligns some of, the practice, some of the practices in computer science to the four C's in problem solving, um, that Superintendent McGee mentioned. And it also includes a number of appendices. So in the appendices, there's guidance for how to, to implement in schools from both discrete implementations, that is, discrete computer science courses, as well as how to integrate at different levels. It includes connections to those other, computer, those other content area standards and CTE, as well as post-secondary education. So these standards are, were recently adopted by the State Board and are now going through a publishing uh, process and will be released shortly, but they're available now on the CDE website and uh, we're excited to see them in action. So uh, I think coming up next is hearing more about um, the, both the opportunities and challenges to implementing those standards. Hi, everybody. There we go. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you for having me on this panel, and I want to welcome all of you and thank all of you for coming. Um, it's exciting to see so many people interested in computer science education. Um, I want to, as a researcher at UCLA, I want to start with a little bit of the history about how it is that we got here so we can chart our course for where we need to go. Um, about the same time that Superintendent McGee was graduating in 2000, 
Um, my fellow researcher colleague, Jane Margolis, was undertaking a project in LA Unified with um, Joanna Good, who's now at University of Oregon. And they began with a basic question, why are there so few African American and Latinx students and girls studying computer science? Really basic question. So they looked at a number of schools in LA Unified and said, let's, let's really dig in deeper. Why is that? Let's not just say we have a problem and solve it. Let's figure out why is there that problem. And they went into schools, and Dr. Furk, I appreciate your uh, reference to um, word processing and typing skills. They went into schools that were serving low-income students of color, and they said, we'd like to come and see your computer science classes. And when they went to those classes, they found nothing more than basic word processing and rudimentary typing skills, but they were calling that computer science. Whereas when they went to the upper income communities that were serving mostly white and Asian students, they were doing the deeper learning that we associate with computer science, the algorithmic thinking, the computational thinking, problem solving, collaboration, and they were actually doing computer science. So uh, there's many other um, examples that I could give. There were interviews with teachers who said, well, these kids are, are um, born to do computer science. And when we dug a little bit deeper and said, what do you mean by some kids are born to do it? They actually had access to after school summer camps or robotics programs. And then they show up to class and they appear to be born to do it whereas other kids haven't had those opportunities and exposure either through their parents or through neighbors or after school programs. So to summarize that research, they found three interlocking variables about why there are so few African American, Latino, Latino, and um, girls doing computer science. And those three interlocking variables are these biased beliefs about who can do computer science. We really need to um, challenge our own assumptions. What are the messages that kids are receiving in the media? What, what um, messages are they receiving a, at home? Who should be taking computer science and who should be taking other classes? So that's one area. A second area is the structural inequalities that exist in schools. How schools are organized. So all of you who are superintendents and work in schools, you see this bearing out about who has access to AP classes, who gets um, counseled by their counselors to go into certain classes, who gets the more advanced um, algebra classes. So there are structural inequalities that exist within this system. And then the third level are policies. So what are the, what are the statewide policies that can actually change those structural inequalities in schools? So Jane, and Joanna and Deborah Richardson and at the time Chris Stevenson who was the Computer Science Teachers Association head, she's now at Google, said we need an organization in California that's really going to tackle these um, statewide problems, the policies. Because they had been looking at different curriculum <coughs> programs and they tried uh, and, and were very successful implementing an introductory computer science program called Exploring Computer Science. And there were many other great programs out there. And there were a lot of great programs that were saying, we're going um, we're gonna to tackle the teacher problem. And we're going to do these kind of one-off programs. And they realized, we kind of have a chicken and egg problem. Because if we just scale up the curriculum, we don't have the teachers to teach it. And then people said, well, let's think of some creative ways to get teachers to teach it. But then when we tried to offer teachers credentials, um, or, or opportunities to teach, they said, why would I go into computer science when there isn't enough classes for me to teach and actually feed my family on a full-time job as a computer science teacher? So there were all these challenges that we said we really need to tackle these with, um, through the state and through statewide policies. So that's how Access was born. And we had been working with a number of different partners in the community, many of you who are here, Microsoft and Children Now, and Assemblywoman Susan Bonilla really had the foresight to say, we actually, we believe that addressing these challenges in computer science, um, like uh, Admiral Breckenridge said, this is, a, this is a marathon, this is not a sprint. And Assemblywoman Bonilla said, well, if it, if it is this long-term process, 
We need to create a long-term plan that's really going to think about how are we mindful about not only implementing computer science education throughout the state, but how do we ensure that all kids have access to it? And when we say all kids, we're talking about African American students, we're talking about Latinx, we're talking about English learners, we're talking about Native American Indian students, we're talking about LGBTQ students, we're talking about students with disabilities. And so it's not an afterthought, it's about how do we bake in equity into everything that we do. So what is this lens when we're looking at policies that we are taking the lessons learned from many of you at the local level and saying what are the challenges and the struggles that you're having at the local level, how can that inform policy, and how can the policy not create unintended consequences that make it harder for you to implement, but really remove those barriers for implementation. So there's this feedback loop of local informing policy, policy supporting implementation with equity at its centerpiece. So with the legislation that uh, Assemblywoman Bonilla passed was to develop a strategic plan. Um, BT and I were honored to be part of that uh, and, and Assemblywoman Bonilla were honored to be on that strategic plan process, an advisory panel that was um, um, through the governor and through the state superintendent of public instruction. And there were many recommendations that came out of that process. It was a, uh, three meetings over the last six months or so, six to nine months. Um, and I'll just hit on, since we're on a roll with the four C's, I'll hit on uh, three C's and leave you with one final C. Um, so the three C's in terms of the outcomes of those recommendations. One was, how do we make computer science count? So not only making it count, but count in a way that incentivizes students to take it. Um, I really wanted my daughter to take computer science, and she said, why would I take it if it doesn't count as a math or science? And I said, well, it counts as a G. It's elective. At least it counts as something. Um, but also, we want it to count towards, towards college admission. So there are recommendations about working with the UCs and getting it to count towards UC and CSU getting it to count toward high school graduation, um, getting, also making sure that computer science counts towards college preparation, towards career preparation, and towards civic participation. So I really appreciate the point about voter engagement and really understanding how do students become creators of technology and creative problem solving using technology and not just passive users of it. The, the second C is developing teacher capacity. So how can the recommendations promote professional development learning opportunities for teachers, providing incentives for teachers to get trained in teaching computer science, building their own compa capacity through PD, and also incentives for teacher preparation programs to develop certification pathways for teachers. Um, the third seems like a no-brainer, but it's actually really important for our rural communities, and that is connectivity and broadband access. And you would think that in a state like California, doesn't everybody have access? But it's not true. Not everyone does. And so there are recommendations around connectivity. So the focus of the strategic plan was really making sure how do we build the structures through our recommendations to ensure all kids have access to high quality computer science. So one of the recommendations is let's just have all high schools offer high quality computer science. Let's start there. We might want to have a, a, a bigger aspirational goal in the long term, but making sure that all schools offer high quality computer science out of the gate is really important. And that we make sure that it's scalable and sustainable in the long term. We don't want computer science to be the next flavor of the day. But we really see this being as a fundamental learning opportunity for all students. And then the last C that I will leave you with is um, what can you do to help make this happen? And that is there's a public comment period that will be opening up in October and November. And in your handout, there's a link to the draft recommendations, or there will be soon. I don't think they're posted quite yet. 
and there will be a public comment period, which I think is an essential component of making sure that this is not a top-down mandate that's coming from the state, but that there is input from educators like many of you and business leaders, higher ed folks, to say this makes sense, this doesn't make sense, this is how it can be better. So I just want to applaud Assemblywoman Bonilla and everyone who supported this process because I do think it's really unique in California to have an open, accountable, transparent process with many stakeholders involved in making the decisions that are best for the diversity of our state. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I want to uh, also echo, uh, thank all those who invited us to uh, come here to speak. Uh, my name again is Emmanuel. I'm a computer science teacher at uh, Oakland Technical High School. I teach computer science in an academy, computer science academy. I started 23 years ago in 1996. So um, you know, I feel like starting my speech in the last on the panel. I, I think about a proverb, an evil proverb that talks about if, you, if you're no good at public speaking, always begin your speech by saying that those who spoke before you have said everything that you wanted to say. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I listened to all the uh, speeches and, and frankly, there's quite a lot that's been said. But when I accepted to be here, I wanted to talk about my experience teaching computer science and growing a computer science program from scratch. I remember the first day I walked into my classroom. There were typewriters, electric typewriters all over the place, and I said, no, this is not what I mean. I just completed my degree in computer science, and I'm so passionate about doing something. Uh, you know, I started teaching math. So, I will share my experience with one of you uh, earlier on about how I saw a student at Saratoga here in California. And this student was preparing for a Microsoft certification. And I thought about it, I said, wait a minute, in Oakland, my students don't even know that there's careers in computing field. And here's a student, a high school student, preparing for uh, Microsoft uh, certification. So I came back, that got me thinking, and that's how I thought, well, I will need to start teaching computer science. I need to study computer science academy. So my experience has been really that all through this past 23 years, there's always been a challenge. So is it possible? Yes. So for schools in California, for districts in California, it is amazingly possible today it's a great thing to be teaching computer science because there's a lot of changes, there's a lot of resources if you have heard the conversation. When I go back 20 years ago, I was I felt isolated in my classroom. There wasn't conversations like this. In fact, I had to bring those conversations to meetings, teachers' meetings, and it was hard to convince a lot of people, even People who are in policy, people who are in the administration, it was very difficult to convince them about what the computer science is. So I've had a parent come to me and say, how can you be teaching computer science when you're not teaching Photoshop, you know, teaching all that. So it, it was a very long and tedious uh, journey, and I have seen them all. I was there, you know, at, um, I went, I came into UCLA you know, the year after it, uh, ECS was piloted, so I met Jane, I met uh, Joanne Goody, I met um, Richard, uh, I mean Deborah Richardson for the first time. So, and of course I've been with you on different panels since then, at the state capital and other places. But the, the point is that there are a lot of challenges that we have to consider. In order to do, uh, teach and develop a computer science program, you must be open you must definitely reach out to not only the community, but the, uh, the industry. You must build partnerships with them. 
and those actually have helped me. I would say that the first year that I started the academy, we, um, I wrote a grant. You know, I wrote to a grant to its, uh, uh, CDE, the California Department of Education, and I got the partnership grant. Without that grant enabled me to provide funding which otherwise I would have been competing for funding. I don't know if my program would have survived. But those we don't have to worry about today. So my point is that those who are coming in now and thinking about establishing computer science or doing any of those things in schools and districts, the conversation is different. You know, a lot of these things that I did, I, you know, legwork, I have to do convincing, you don't have to deal with that. They were, so your battle is cut out for you. Um, one of the things that I benefit from the CPA grant is that every year I have to write a report to the State Department and show them how computer science is changing in our Oakland area. And I'm sorry to be talking only about Oakland, but I believe that what we, what's happening in Oakland now is happening everywhere in the country. So we're talking about how APD and access, yes, when I started in computer science program, that was the main trust of it. So everything that I thought about when I talked about curriculum, pedagogy, and strategies, it was always to address the issue of equity and access. You know, at the time, Oakland was only 40 minutes away from Silicon Valley at the time when it was a dot-com boom, you know, era, the dot-com era. And students in Oakland didn't even know what CSAs that there were even careers in, in, in computer science. So we had to develop something that will attract them and keep them. So my talk today is only going to reflect recruitment, how I was, you know, what strategies I used to recruit students. And I'm going to talk about the fact that you recruit them, but you have to think about retaining them until graduation. Because getting them into the classroom is one thing. But all of the issues that we've talked about, you know, in terms of what computer science is, in terms of the big ideas in computer science and computer thinking, you have to think of how do I get my students to take those classes and stay within it until graduation. Because some of the challenges we're seeing and you know have consistently been the problem. So one of the things that I I um, I do for uh, recruitment every year in February I use the same students that I have girls and you know kids who represent who are underrepresented that are in the program they become the ones that I use to go reach out to other kids. And I want to say that the CPA program is a three-year program. In other words, the nine, we recruit nine graders who will now make a three-year commitment with us and take computer science, one, at least one computer science class each year until graduation. So when I started, and I want to thank Microsoft because the very first year in 96 when I started, Microsoft was the first company to reach out to us, they made a big software donation. And I used a lot of donations because I was reaching out to everybody that I could. You know. So, well, we have uh, students who come into classes and make presentations, talk about CS, show their projects to other students. And that is one strategy that we use. I did a week-long activity in which we take students out to the industry on trips. We go to college and visit in, uh, Berkeley, and a lot of local colleges have programs that they do on the CS Education Week. So I take, opportunity, I take advantage of that week. I bring in all the students in my school to come in and experience what computer science is. Because let's really face it, my program is, you know, we only have 200 uh, students at most. 
But this is a school of 2000, which means that most of our students will go through high school without ever experiencing what computer science is. So we try to fit in so much in that week. Hour of code, I work with the PE teachers to bring all their students through, and I have my students trained as, as um, uh, in, you know, T, uh, TAs to help with doing those kind of projects. So, so there's a lot of ways that we do that, and then after that, you know, you talk to students who are interested to join, and once they join, how do we keep them? Because the, the, this is a big challenge. One of the things that people may not, you know, know is that a lot of students are coming into high schools without certain skills, problem solving skills, basic writing skills, math skills, and you are going to put them in these programs. So you better start working out strategies that you would use to get really involved in CS. For the first time, they had to create an office at the central office. And now we have somebody who runs CS, you know. So, but prior to that, it was, you know, I had to do the legwork, I had to do the reach out, and I, so a lot of those things, even though I still do, or we still do, but the trust of it is now central, just like Brian. Uh, Brian. So, um, but this is a work that has to go on. Another component, and I think I started talking about it, is work-based learning, okay? So work-based learning involves job chartering, internships, and all of those kinds of things. And those have always been part of my program. In fact, if during the summer, I would put about 60, 65 students assigned to different industries. You know, what, easy transit, local, law, place, you know, just a lot of places. So that they give students the opportunity to connect what they are learning in the classroom, uh, you know, CS concepts and all those things, connect them to job place skills. So, and that, to me, is really critical and important. Particularly for students of color, a lot of them don't have opportunities. A lot of them are coming from parents, from families where nobody has held a job before. So, creating those kinds of experiences is really critical for them. And we have to find ways. We have to build those types of opportunities by reaching out to local businesses. And I can tell you that a lot of local businesses are very willing to help. But many of them don't even know what. I mean, if they don't know what, they can't help. You have to reach out to them, sit with them, explain with them, to, uh, to them. Create an advisory committee, which I have, and invite them to be part of it. They come in there with solutions, they come in there with things, they come in there with opportunities that they are job places. And that's how I'm able to increase the number of connections where students can go and experience. And frankly, it, to me, it's probably one of the most important aspects of Nairobi because it's a game changer for some kids. They come back from those internships and now they are just willing to stay they are now willing to do a lot of things to make sure that they become CS graduates. So, and it's a really critical aspect of it. Thank you, Ms. Orendor. <laughs> Thanks for being a leader and a pioneer uh, in computer science teaching. In our So now I want to open it up to any Q&A that the uh, audience might have. We've got about 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, and are we, uh, Ellen, or we passing around a mic to, do we have a, uh, let's grab this mic and then I'll pass around this to folks who want to answer. Uh, with Mr. Sarver uh, and then Ms. McAvoy. Thank you. Uh, there's been such a wonderful breadth of content discussed here. And there's so much to this topic. Uh, and, and all of this is front and center in the Sequoia Union High School District, which serves this area. Um, I had two areas I wanted to touch on, but rather than monopolizing everything, I'm going to kind of blindside uh, one of our uh, faculty members who's here, our, uh, our uh, vice principal from the new Tide Academy, Mike Kaliga, is here. And I'm going to kind of blindside him and say, I'd like you to talk and, and ask a little bit about 
the development of the Tide Academy, how it fits with um, what we've been talking about here and some of the questions you've got about how, um, how uh, it can be helped. And I'll let you cogitate on that until you're ready to raise your hand. <laughs> the thing I wanted to, to focus on directly is uh, what we could be doing really broadly across our county to, to pull together and support. And I know uh, Dr. McGee has been a, a really critical supporter at the County Office of Education of developing a strong career technical education department that has been growing in leaps and bounds and beginning the process of developing regional advisory boards in different career pathway areas. Uh, and one of the most critical is computer science and the huge technical community that we reside in. And I know there is a, a major uh, conference that's coming up on Wednesday afternoon. Um, and uh, I was also uh, interested in hearing that you know there is there are industry-based efforts to build broad advisory boards, and I hope we very much make sure that those efforts come together so that we have a strong single regional hub that really uh, gives the most possible leverage to all of our programs and all of our classroom teachers to get those connections going. I'd like Dr. McGee and some of the others in the, on the panel to, to talk about those things. Dr. McGee. Thank you, Board Member Sarver. Um, one thing that the County Office of Education, the role we can play, and this is in districts where, or in counties where there are multiple school districts, it's not as uh, impactful in a single city, single county uh, district. But when you have multiple districts, you, there is a problem with fragmentation and noise and people butting up against each other for resources, which uh, means we're basically fighting each other. So the county office can play a role of coordination and facilitation to help that. One thing we're doing uh, in our CTE work is we, just, uh, we are about to partner with Orange County Office of Education to provide CTE credentials for teachers in San Mateo County that right now there's no easy way for them to access that work. So building that um, capacity in our workforce is one way to attack this. Um, the other idea we have, we have a, a wonderful outdoor education model in San Mateo County where I think our fifth graders go out into the woods for a week and immerse in wilderness education. Uh, we have an idea that we could do the same for middle schoolers that we pull them out and immerse them in the environment of computer science and bring in all kinds of partners around the community. Uh, one thing I would say is that as far as students go, I'm not sure they know how many jobs there are. Uh, we are all adults sitting in this room and we get that data, but where is that message getting to kids? And I think if, if you were standing there working with kids in that kind of immersive environment, they, their eyes would be open in a big hurry, and when kids start demanding curriculum, then we know we're doing the right thing. Anybody else want to speak to that, or go on to the next question? Yeah, I just like, Please. I think, can everybody hear me if I don't take the mic? The, the one thing I would offer you, I work with a uh, public charter school in downtown Oakland. Um, one of the things that we've experienced firsthand is that kids only know what they know. And that sounds very simple. But if you take a job like somebody wants to go and work in the finance arena, what they think that job is mentally, if you spend just a little bit of time talking to them, you can open their aperture up. For instance, in the law enforcement arena, uh, federal law enforcement arena, when we were working uh, against the large businesses working in the uh, illegal drugs and so forth, the first breakthroughs that we had were people who were able to use technology to track money. You know, so when you start talking to kids about the different kinds of things that they can do with something that they're interested in, they're absolutely amazed at the span that's really open to them. So I would really encourage you to say, what are some of the things that we can do? Have different people with different careers come in and talk. Get the kids talking about what they're interested in and then press them for what they really know about that skill set and what they might be able to do. Because they're shocked and excited when they hear about the possibilities. Great. This is my boy. Uh, 
Hi, uh, my name is Elisa McAvoy. I'm on the Redwood City School District Board, and then I'm also on the California School Boards Association Board of Directors. Thank you, Assembly Berman. Really appreciate you having this conversation. Thank you to all the panelists. Uh, what a passionate group of individuals. And I guess the plug, I have so much to say. I feel like we could spend hours, and I hope that we'll continue to have this conversation and really work through some of the issues. Because you're right, it's not a sprint. It's going to be a marathon. And the plug I would just want to put in today is right now, up and down the state, school districts are slashing programs and cutting programs because we don't have enough money. And I think probably a lot of you know this in the room, but uh, we are down in, you know, like 41, 40, the good news actually, we're 41st in the state, I think. We used to be 46 or 48, so we're making progress. A recent report came out getting down to facts two that just came out last week, and so I really encourage everybody to take a look at that. But all these experts, professionals came together and they said we're about $22 billion away from where we need to be. So that's about a 32% funding gap for California kids. We educate about 6 million plus kids for the United States. Um, in K-12, so we need to make this work. So I applaud everybody here. I just want to put in a plug, we're going to need more funding. You that are at the school district, you know this better than anyone. And so um, I did just want to say that in Redwood City, the last five years, we've made a lot of progress. And it really has been because of community partnerships. We've had Chan Zuckerberg, Google, Sobrato, uh, Silicon Valley Leadership Group, some others come in to help us. So I just want to put in a plug that every school district in California right now could use that help. So I love this idea of how do we engage more of the experts, the tech people, and just the people with money. Because we're going to need money to make this happen. And I don't want to sound like a broken record because money is not everything. But you need to have a basic amount of money before you can actually do what we're talking about here. Thank you. Thank you, Board Member McAvoy. I think I pack up your, your comment that we need money. Yeah, thank yeah. you. <laughs> Oh, and uh, real quick, I've got uh, one comment. Thank you. So, so you you are absolutely right, and this is where um, this really is a marathon because the recommendations that are coming out of the strategic plan that I very briefly talked about will evolve into legislation, which will be attached to funding. And this is where I really appreciate Assemblymember Berman's involvement because this is going to be the heavy lifting in this year's legislature to say now that we've invested in the strategic plan, what, how are we going to put our money where our mouth is when we talk about supporting the education of our students? And it is going to take a budget item or a couple that will need to be included in the next legislative package. Um, the recommendations will be in to the State Board of Education next March in July 2019, and then presented to the legislature in July. And so this is where all of your input really comes into play, and amplifying everything that you heard today and sharing it with other board members, with school leaders, with parents, with your representatives in really supporting the fact that we will need funding. Yes, we need public-private partnerships. We also need a significant state investment, and that's going to be the tough part. Yeah, I just want to add that um, it, it would be nice to for teachers, districts, to know that a lot of organizations out there, like if it's Cisco has uh, an academy and they, you know, they would train teachers. Uh, Oracle has a long going, I mean, I benefited a lot from, from their training. So and these things are free. And the uh, University of California Berkeley, you know, they are one of the sponsors of the CP, uh, uh, APCSP. And during the summer, there's so many programs, so many training programs out there for teachers and, and, and it just brings me that. So, time flies when you're having fun, and we've actually already overshot our Q&A time, but let's just do like lightning round, 30 second question or comments, 30 second responses, and I'll shorten up my closing remarks. Please, go ahead. So my name's Mike Kalig, and I have the honor of being uh, Vice Principal for Thai Academy, Technology Innovation, Design and Engineering. Uh, we're a small public high school that's start in startup mode in the Sequoia Union High School District. Uh, we'll be right over next to Facebook, and we have our first students August of 2019. Um, 
Right now we have five founding teachers, a principal and a vice principal who are all attending. Um, we are, part of our model is partnering with uh, local community colleges, Foothill and Kenyatta. Um, pretty much everywhere we've gone, we've had a pretty easy time establishing partnerships, but the, the sticky piece seems to be with industry. And I'm wondering what we can do from a policy perspective and a legislative perspective to encourage that public-private partnership and get industry involved. Um, it's great to have software, it's, money's always good, um, but at the end of the day, the underrepresented students that we serve that we're trying to get into these tech careers really need the connections with industry professionals, the mentorships, and are really the biggest lift that we've had and the biggest sticking point uh, are the internships. Um, I was a CPA lead teacher as well, and I remember trying to get those started, and it's a Herculean effort to get 60 of these internships. Um, and it's, you know, you place the students wherever you can, but really if you want them in tech jobs, you need to get them in tech companies. Yeah. I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> uh, a couple of quick thoughts on that. Uh, one, it's, from my perspective, sitting inside a tech company, the number of requests that we get for internships and mentorships is frankly overwhelming and it speaks to the fragmentation that we've been talking about, that there are a number of amazing nonprofits and a really amazing number of school districts and need more collaboration and coordination in this space so that it isn't a fragmented effort that everyone's trying to do, but that there's, there's something that's more holistic going on, more holistic thinking going on. I will also add something, and this is the part where I'm getting in trouble. Um, one of the things that's difficult for me when we're asked for mentors, especially mentors of color and women mentors inside the company, is that we don't have a ton of them. And so I'm very torn between wanting to protect them so they occasionally get to come and see their families, uh, so that they get to do a really good job at work and get promoted and are therefore making decisions 10 years down the line, um, and not just asking them constantly to come out and do this. Can you come out and do this? Can you add this to you? Can you volunteer here? Can you do this? Can you be my token representative somewhere? Um, but there has to be a more holistic approach than simply pulling these people out of their jobs and away from the rest of their lives and, re and recognizing that this is an effort that we all have to engage in together and that we shouldn't rely necessarily on. But I, I have some reservations about asking that of my employees because I want them to succeed and live full lives as well. Um, and, and I think that there's a lot of work that people who are overrepresented can do to spend some of their um, political and social capital and, and capital capital uh, to get this work done too. Right, guys. Thank you, and that could be a whole different panel on its own. And we're gonna have time for y'all to chat afterwards. Yes. Right, just really please. quick, like <laughs> thirty seconds, I swear. Uh, I'm Access uh, Equity Innovation Specialist for one of the 23 uh, uh, districts in San Mateo County, and I just I'm a K-8 school district, so I do want to first of all thank you. This is all great, and everything that you've talked about is all true. Um, but I want to uh, really uh, reinforce the fact for K-8. It, you know, we know that if we don't show fundamentals in K-8, they're not gonna take this cottage and all that, um, but how can we really support our K-5 teachers with understanding what computer science is? And if you ask any average person, what is computer science? I, I guarantee you probably will not get a very good answer. So for me, part of my job is messaging. I think it's still hugely important that we continue to message what computer science is and also to reiterate, how, on the county level, might we work to integrate computer science as we are transitioning to next generation science standards so we can show more of an integrated learning approach. So I look forward to what the county office um, and the peninsula will be doing to help us with that mission. And on a side note, we do need to pay our teachers. Um, sorry, I'm sorry, I can't just ask them. I know we have teacher leaders and they're going to always be that person that will do it for free. But we, we can't do that, we can't rely on that. We want all of our teachers because we are not going to have uh, equitable learning for all those kids and it has to be done during the school day. Very quickly, Jessica, to your point, there is no more compelling um, information than what you shared that you're gonna get in trouble for that speaks to the absolutely compelling reason why we have to be start early and we have to have the equity lens way out in front. This has to be an intentional effort. Um, and wherever you went to, um, the county office has several people, um, science coordinator and our computer science coordinator who are bouncing up and down on trampolines waiting to get to you. So if, um, if, if you can connect with me, then we will get you set up.
Thank you. And the question line is closed, so no more getting up because it's gr no, no, no. It's a, but, but it's grown uh, over the past few minutes, so it's cut off now. Uh, but please go ahead. Okay. Hi. I'm Stacey Ashland from Palo Alto Unified, and I was a math and CS major in the 80s. Because they don't, well, the messaging needs to be, the research is showing the messaging need, needs to be that this is about fun and logic and creativity and helping people. Because it, when our girls hear, you need to take CS, they're like, I don't want some boring computer job. And technology for good is a huge up and coming area. And lastly, thank you to the woman on this, I didn't catch your name, for mentioning students with disabilities. Um, SAP is one of the companies I believe that has programs for students with um, high functioning autism and we need a lot more corporate partners that recognize that students with disabilities can really shine in this area. Thank you. Go ahead. Okay, so my name is Kyle Grumbly. I'm the director of the Professional Learning Network at Kraft Center for Innovation at Foothill College. I can help solve maybe some of these problems for all of you. So first of all, we have all the coursework. If you have teachers looking at that supplemental authorization in computer science, we have the coursework in place to do that now. Um, the total cost of that is $1,200, which is the cheapest price you're gonna find anywhere around. Um, the past three summers, we've had a computer science crash course. It's been well attended. One summer, we had about 65. This past summer, we had about 60. Um, most of the courses can be now offered online. We also have a Makerspace Coordinator Certificate, the only community college in the state that has this. This past summer, we put 44 people through that program. So they have 10 of the 18 units towards that certification. And half of those people went through a program that's called Maker Unit Diversity that is designed for women, women of color, women of special needs. So we did all of that and, and women veterans as well. Um, and also, uh, Assemblyman Berman, we're gonna be asking for your support on SB 577 that just passed, that we will be applying for that. We'd like to be able to offer credentials so that we can kind of spread this out statewide and get this going on an online basis as well. Thank you, and thanks to the Cross Center for uh, Innovation. I know Gabe Krause is here, and they do fantastic work uh, at Foothill College. Uh, so thank you so much yeah. for being here. Yeah, I didn't introduce you. Uh, hi, yeah. my name's Randy Tree. Sorry to be in addition to the line, but one of the other uh, questions that fired me to get up. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Stephen Wong. Um, I've been a teacher at Sequoia Union High School District for over 15 years, and now I'm with Thai Academy for uh, teaching math. Uh, I got up because uh, I have two kids of my own, and uh, they're um, fifth grade and uh, second grade. And um, at home, uh, we we will play games, and uh, at the same time, like I want to, I wanted to expose to coding because I believe that um, coding is a language that they have to be exposed for the future careers and plus uh, I totally believe in if the kids can read and write and do multiplications they can absolutely code there are different levels of coding and uh, we, if we are serious about uh, changing the CS and bringing it into classroom it cannot just be high school level it has to be vertical um, articulation of like coming from um, elementary to middle school to um, um, high school to college so that way like uh, kids have the fundamental of coding and when they're uh, when we expose to old computer science, they have a better understanding of what that is about. That's great. Thank you very much. So now, uh, I'd like to give our sponsors the opportunity to make some brief comments. Uh, we're very fortunate to have many of our sponsors here, um, and would like to ask folks to keep their comments to around a minute if possible, but start off um, and, and 
Susan, you take as much time as you want. Former <laughs> Senator Mayor Susan Bonilla, uh, representing Council for a Strong America, Vision Readiness, and Ready Nation. Um, yes, and maybe the sponsors, you know who you are, probably you want to join me and we'll make it lightning round as well. Uh, but it's such a privilege to be part of a nonprofit, Council for a Strong America, where our members are volunteers, uh, generals, admirals, business leaders, and uh, members of law enforcement leaders as, as well. Uh, and what they do is they come together to advocate for kids. And so what an incredible opportunity today. And we want to thank Assemblymember Berman and his staff. We want to thank, I want to thank my staff as well for all of the hard work in bringing together um, so many different perspectives because we really believe that's what it's going to take to make this a successful effort for every child in the state of California. So we want you to take this information today. We have a report available at the front table. Share it with those you know in the different sectors, business sectors, law enforcement sectors, uh, in our military sectors. And uh, we want everyone to be able to come together to be part of this effort, to see themselves as stakeholders. Because we know we need everyone here in California to believe this uh, must happen in or order for it to happen. So thank you so very much for this great panel and to all of our amazing panelists. That was wonderful information that you shared today. Thank you. My name is Paul Escobar. I'm the Director of Policy and Education Programs with the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. Huge thank you to you, Assemblymember Berman and Assemblymember Bonilla. This really highlights why we need political leadership on this question and what you can make happen. We're proud to be here supporting you. And to all the panelists, to the other sponsors of the event today, I'll just say very quickly, from our perspective, we're a policy trade association representing about 360 companies in the region. For us, this is not just a workforce question, this is a basic skills question. We've heard a lot about the tech industry, but as we become more reliant on technologies everywhere, every industry will be a tech industry. And if we want to make sure that the next generation has the skills to be able to succeed in that world, to contribute to that world, and that's also to Susan Bonilla's point about security. So th this hits on really every level that we can think of, and that's why we're involved, and we're very proud to be here. Thank you, Paul. Hi, I'm Robin Hines with Microsoft. Hi. I'm the Senior Director of Government Affairs based in Sacramento. I enjoyed my three-plus hour drive down. <laughs> um, but as Jessica pointed out earlier, and you've heard from some of the other speakers, um, Microsoft is very committed and passionate about expanding access to computer science. Um, we've partnered with many of you in the community, in the classroom, and in the capital. Just to the, the three yeses. <laughs> um, and I just you know, really appreciate convening of this um, forum today. It's, it's really inspiring, and we stand ready to continue these partnerships into 2019 and beyond. Thank you so much. www.access-ca.org and sign up to be a subscriber. We will keep you informed of latest updates around computer science education equity in California, as well as the CS for CA campaign, and I have stickers for anyone who wants them. Thank you so much. Thank you. I want to recognize a couple of electeds that I missed earlier. We have Jody Muirhead, from the board, uh, board member of the Santa Clara Unified School District. Uh, Brian Johnson, board member of Los Altos School District. She's already recognized. Oh, did I recognize Brian already? And Joe Ross, uh, board member of the San Mateo County Office of Education in the corner. Uh, I hope everyone has found this discussion to be as enlightening and informative as I have. Frankly, I'm shocked that we're only 10 minutes late because there's so much to discuss, and we knew that we were uh, a little ambitious in our, in our timing for today, but this is just the first of many conversations. This really is gonna be a marathon, uh, and now's the time to keep the momentum going uh, in, in light of these recent achievements. I'm committed to leading on this issue in the legislature, and I plan to introduce legislation in the upcoming session 
uh, after meeting with stakeholders and identifying the state's role in promoting computer science education. So please stay tuned for that. Uh, and there are also steps that everyone here can take, and I think Julie alluded to this, but the draft computer science strategic implementation plan, which has been discussed today, is still a draft. The Instructional Quality Commission and the State Board of Education are seeking input on the draft, implement, uh, on the draft implementation plan during their 30-day public review and comment period. There will be a survey which will remain open through November 9th of this year, and you can also send comments on the draft implementation plan to CSSIPP at cde.ca.gov. And for everyone who didn't just write that down, we can get it to you. Uh, I would encourage you to participate and provide feedback. It is critical to have input from stakeholders like you before the plan is taken to the State Board of Education for adoption. Uh, I also want to thank everyone who attended and participated today, Superintendent Alec McGee, uh, all of our panelists, thank you so much. Uh, uh, former Assemblymember Bonilla for all of your work uh, over the many years. Uh, our sponsors, everyone in the audience, and, and last but especially not least, I want to thank my staff, uh, who for this event have been led by my legislative director, Ellen Green. And where did Ellen go? She's against the wall. joining Robin in that drive down from Sacramento this morning. Um, and we'll now move to the reception. Thank you to Microsoft for sponsoring uh, and Silicon Valley Leadership Group for organizing the reception. Uh, this will be a great opportunity to continue the conversation and go deeper into a lot of the questions that were asked. So thank you all so much for joining us today.